Okay. So welcome all to the One World Minds talk. It's my pleasure that we have Lenka Steborova. She is a professor of physics and computer science at EPFL, where she leads the statistical physics and of computation laboratory. Um, she did her PhD combined between Université Paris Sud and Charles University in Prague. Then she spent two years at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and then 10 years as CNRS researcher in uh, theoretical physics in uh, France. And she's won a lot of prizes, so I'm just trying to, to read a couple to you. So she won the CNRS bronze medal, the Philippe Meillet prize, the Irene Joliot Curie prize, and of course, an ERC starting grant. And this was in 2018, so unfortunately, no jobs more here. She is a member of the editorial board for Journal of Physics and so on and so on. And she works on statistical physics, applying that um, the methods from there to machine learning. And what she enjoys most is erasing the boundaries between theoretical physics, math, and computer science. And it's our pleasure to have her here and have a talk about um, insights into neural networks from um, high dimensional, I forgot that part of the talk, but here we go. So <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Karen, and thanks to everybody in the organization for, for having me and everybody in the audience for coming to listen. So let's hope that you have some good time in the next hour or so. So as Karen said, I want to tell you somehow an, the spirit and overview and some recent results of where um, kind of the theoretical statistical physics is these days um, relevant in, in thinking about understanding what's happening in training neural networks. Um, so is the seminar on mathematics of information data and signals. I think a lot about information data and signals being also part of the um, faculty in computer science and what concerns the mathematics. You will see that you know some of the methods that we are using are these days established mathematically, but more historically or traditionally, this kind of subfield of studying computational problems from statistical physics perspective is a champion in providing conjectures for the mathematicians to prove. So even if not everything comes with a proof, you know, just like you can you can fish for some cool results that are you know, very very confidently true, but may not have proofs yet. So I will start with this slide that I call you know, some very early works in high dimensional statistics. And what you will notice as I kind of, as it's kind of anticipated in the introduction is that A, these are not published in statistics journals. They are not published by statisticians and they are published somewhat before high dimensional statistics became kind of a main direction in, in statistics, which was say at best in the nineties with, with uh, maybe things like the comprocessing and the geometric picture behind it and things like that. So it's about learning from examples is in large neural networks and about the generalization in neural networks and the storage capacity and things like that. And the first part of the talk, I will kind of walk you through the, through what actually is in those papers and how that kind of fits in what we are hearing about neural networks these days. So, you know, the, 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 I will start with, you know, if we go to Wikipedia and read the motivation or kind of why high dimensional statistics is an important thing to look at, you read that its emergence owes to many modern data sets in which the dimension of the data vector may be comparable or even larger than say the simple sample size. So the justification for the use of traditional techniques often based on asymptotic arguments with the dimension held fixed and the sample size increasing lacks. Okay, sounds reasonable. That's what yeah, kind of one would say to the students these days. But now the interesting thing is that those physics works in the 90s, they were not motivated by that. They were before kind of the data deluge and that motivation being relevant. Why they studied the high dimension limits? It was because 
in a sense, kind of what is summarized or reflected in this uh, kind of quite famous essay by Phil Anderson, who is one of the physics Nobel Prizes in published in science is more is different. And there he makes the, the point that the behavior of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles, so he's a physicist, he talks of particles, it turns is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of few particles, and instead at each level of complexity entirely new properties appear. And sometimes that limit actually simplifies things. So their motivation was this, when we actually look at the high dimensional limit, we can write something that comes in a close form where we can understand what is happening. So it's not only that the data are high dimensional, but it actually helps us to understand things and different things happen from what we would kind of naively expect by looking at just few dimensions. So, and then this is a line of work that, you know, was pretty active as a textbooks in those years uh, and kind of recently came to light, uh, for instance, with the Nobel Prize for, for Giorgio Parisian Physics, but the Nobel Committee kind of highlights that his work is kind of relevant in many different areas, such as mathematics, biology, neuroscience, machine learning. So, so let me kind of go into explaining what, what's in those papers and what we do about it today. And for that, just to set kind of the notation, what I will mean by neural network in this talk is as many, you know, as we usually do, I just think about a neural network as a parametric function that takes an input X, sorry, and outputs the label Y and is parameterized by weights W that you know, if you were just doing linear regression, it's just a vector or generalized linear regression where you apply a nonlinearity here, W is a vector, but in a multilayer neural network, this is a set of matrices of weights. And the index mu here, that would stand for the different samples. So the different say pictures of cats or dogs. That will be my notation. And then jumping straight ahead into kind of the simplifications that we, usually make in statistical physics to make these um, interesting questions approachable, I will get to the questions in a moment, is this teacher-student setting, where what we actually put aside is the kind of approximation part of the question, that the function that you're learning is not known and you must learn it. That's kind of the core of, uh, of, of machine learning. So here we put that aside, but we still keep a lot of non-trivial things in. I will go to that. We assume that the function from X to Y is actually itself given by a neural network that we will call teacher neural network that is generate that that has a certain architecture, and one actually generates some teacher weights W star that are independent of the X that in most of my talk will just be IID random weights that defines a function. Then from any X, we can generate labels Y. And then the student network, it observes the pairs X and Y, the samples as usual. It may observe the architecture of the teacher network that can only make the job simpler, not harder, but it doesn't observe the vector of weights W star. Those are latent variables. Those are not known, those are hidden. And the goal of the student is to learn the same function, not necessarily the same Ws, but the same function so that it has a good test error on test samples. So that's exactly what those papers in the 80s did, uh, but in particular in the simplest possible case where the teacher network does not have hidden units. So it is just a generalized linear regression. There is just the input, one vector of weights, a nonlinearity applied to produce the labels. That's the ground truth function. And the student wants to learn it, okay? And the, the kind of two questions that I, want to answer and that you know, are generically important in machine learning, but in the specific setting that I'm describing, I will be able to, to, to answer them quite precisely. Uh, A, what is the best information theoretically achievable test error on the labels that we will call the minimum mean square error? And information theoretically is nice, but if we cannot find them with an efficient algorithm, it's not useful. So the second question is, what is the best efficiently achievable test error? 
that will be some MSC algorithmic. We must provide a specific efficient algorithm that actually gives us this MSC. And then of course, a you know third question is, are these actually the same or not? And so that's the ones we will focus on, but it's, it's still, the setting that I described is still too generic to kind of give a satisfactory kind of full answer. What was done, so, so okay. Um, with the setting that I have given, we have in principle, now we know what should be done to actually uh, be able to compute the information theoretically optimal error. What needs to be done, given that we said that the labels are generated by a teacher given some weights W and the inputs X, that teacher function actually translates into a channel, if you want or a probability distribution that then plays the role of a likelihood in a posterior distribution. The distribution from which the teacher generates the weights is the prior. One over Z is the normalization. So this is the posterior that is written because I, diff I kind of postulated how the data were generated. And given the posterior, the information theoretically, or I call it base optimal prediction of a new label for a new sample, is the following. One is to take the function of the teacher, but one doesn't know the weights W. So what one does, one actually averages over the Ws taken from the posterior. So that's kind of the Bayesian formulation of the optimal test error if one actually knows the process that generated the data. That is different from what we kind of teach our undergrad students. The first thing in machine learning, you write some loss and a regularization. This gives you a loss function that you minimize, right? And traditionally, kind of a lot of theory about machine learning is about that minimization process, about the gradient-based algorithms trying to achieve it. But in these high-dimensional problems, this is actually not in general the best thing to do. The best thing to do is to indeed average the weights W taken from the posterior. So we know what to do in principle. Of course, the trouble is that this is a high dimensional, the dimension D will be large. So this is a high dimensional probability distribution. So sampling from it is in no way easy or tractable in general, it's not easy. So in order to, um, to make it really tractable and solvable to understand what's, what's the best achievable error, we need to do as additional assumptions. And that's uh, you know those that again have been done in those papers. I'm still talking back about what has been done in those papers. And so on top of the you know teacher student setting, we do three additional things. So first of all, we take the input data random IID Gaussian, and towards the end of the talk, I will talk about how to go beyond that. We take the weights to be also random IID from some distribution PW, that is just a distribution on a scalar on just the components of the weights. Then the function is what it is. This sign can be something else that, that will be a generic function. And three, we take this high dimensional limit, which uh, actually will simplify the, the, the which will al allow us to write a deterministic uh, equation for what actually the optimal test error is. So it's simplifying our life in this case. And given that, then we can write, um, and that's what they did using kind of a non-rigorous um, re replica method uh, back then. But these days having the same result actually due to works that we have done a couple years back, it, it's, it can be written as a theorem. Now here, the way I state the result is a kind of a meta theorem saying that with the assumptions that I said, so the factorized prior, the random IID input, and this high dimension limit where the number of samples over the dimension it is a constant, but both the dimension and number of samples go to infinity. We get a formula that we call the free entropy that I will show on the next slide that depends on one scalar parameter and it applies both the minimum mean square error, so the information theoretically achievable test error, and the minimum and the mean square error achieved by a concrete algorithm that we call the approximate message passing. So it's not in general the same. The minimum mean square error is given by the global maximizer of this function. 
And the performance of this algorithm AMP is given by the local maximizer that has the lowest value of this parameter M that leads to the worst error from all the local maximizers. So that's kind of the statement of the, you know, on this slide, say meta theorem, it's very generic, but it's all written precisely in our papers. And now maybe I'm wondering, okay, how does this formula look like? Okay, it's a formula. So this free entropy, what it is actually, is the expectation of the logarithm of the normalization in that posterior. The theorem actually says that this quantity that, you know, even if I did not put the expectation here, this actually concentrates on this deterministic uh, formula that is what we call this free entropy. It depends here on two parameters. Here is a spe one special function, another special function this one depends on the prior distribution over here. This one depends on the non-linearity that the teacher was using or on the channel of how the labels are generated given the X times W. And it comes in a form of this Gaussian integral or an integral over the scalar variable W that comes from the prior. So it kind of looks okay. You have never seen it before. It looks not very you know, intuitive, transparent. But what is included in that function? Well, I told you that the, the minimum mean square error and the error that a certain algorithm achieves. And the way this is just a corollary is that the optimal test error can actually be just expressed in terms of the maximizer of this formula this way. So, okay, once you maximize, it's just a question of plugging it into a formula that includes three scalar integrals. So it's in principle is not very hard to evaluate, nothing is high dimensional anymore. And about this algorithm, I was mentioning my approximate message passing, but I didn't tell you yet what it is. So here it's a kind of pseudo code. It's an iterative algorithm where you iterate um, four quantities in this case. Uh, two of them play the role of the estimates of the variances and means of the weights. And then it's a iterative equations, iterative process for those, where again, there are some special functions here, G out here, F A here that relate to the prior and the output channel. And other than that is just a bunch of matrix multiplications with your inputs here and these estimators. So it's a very kind of easy to implement and parallelize algorithm. And what it includes directly in there is actually a quantity if you, give me a new sample x new here. So now the x is here, that will be the training set. But now if you give me a test sample x new, and I iterated this till convergence, I will take this t here large, or at actually any time of the iteration, I can compute the um, label at, at large time, that would be the label that corresponds to the base optimal uh, prediction, just by realizing that actually the what comes into the channel actually has a, has a, is, a, is a Gaussian with this distribution with some parameters that are actually the variables that I iterate in this algorithm. So it gives us access to this um, minimum mean square error, at least in those cases where it is indeed equal that these two maxima that matter are indeed equal to each other. This algorithm actually in the high dimensional limit achieves the optimality. So it gives us a tractable way to get this base optimal estimator that in general, you know, involves sampling from high dimensional probability distribution. And the nice thing about this uh, particular algorithm, the approximate message passing is that it has this state evolution, which is again related to the same formula. One can prove, and this goes uh, back to the works of uh, the group of Andrea Montanari, that actually the error it achieves at a given point of time is given by, in a sense, a gradi discrete gradient ascent of this one dimensional or two dimensional, in this case, if I keep the M hat in, uh, function phi RS. So that's again a kind of a deterministic uh, scalar description of the performance of the algorithm. So there was a few slides that were a bit technical. So if you got lost, never mind, come back. <laughs> now I will show you kind of what, what this implies and the answer to these two questions in the setting I'm talking about. So one case, for instance, to go back to one of the three papers I showed you at the beginning, 
was this uh, case where the neural network has binary synapses, which means that the T2 weights are binary, plus minus one in D dimensions. And this is a picture from the paper with some generalization error as a function of alpha, the number of samples over dimension, with some interesting numbers here. So let me maybe kind of plot it my own way and, and describe in more detail what this picture is. It's a picture from, from, from that paper, but it's exactly the same kind of lines as, as in that uh, old physics paper. So once again, the teacher weights are binary, the high dimension limit, and the teacher produces the labels this way with a sign. And this is the test error as a function of the number of samples per dimension. In red, you have the minimum mean square error on the test. So that's what's best achievable, whatever you do. You have an interesting behavior that at small number of samples, it kind of goes down, but not particularly good. Then at 1.245, it jumps discontinuously to zero. So after this number of samples times the dimension, you can generalize to zero test error in this case. The approximate message passing algorithm, green is, is state evolution, black is a run on some system of I know 10,000 dimensions, something like that. That actually lags a bit behind. It follows exactly the red line, it's just below, that's what you don't see it. Then it lags a bit behind and jumps to zero a little bit later on at 1.493. So there is a region where uh, information theoretically you can reach zero test error, but this particular algorithm doesn't reach it. There is a curious conjecture in the field that actually no other efficient algorithm would reach it. That's of course a very bold conjecture and would be kind of for another talk, the kind of computation complexity implications of that. But for the purpose of this talk, let's just take it, you know, there's a good algorithm that lags just a bit behind, not much. Whereas if you hit this, it's a classification problem, right? The labels here are binary. If you hit this classification problem with, you know, your favorite say logistic regression, there's a simple function. So you would expect that logistic regression is maybe not so bad. It does not pick this um, this phase transition, this sharp drop to zero. Not may maybe so surprisingly because it has no way of actually including the information in that the teacher weights were binary, whereas the approximate message passing has that information included in the prior. But okay, that's that's kind of what was already computed back then in the in the papers. So I will keep talking about a phase transition and go to a case that is a bit more interesting for at least two reasons. One is that I don't need to assume that the weights are binary, which is something that you know, gradient descent type of algorithms would usually not assume. And B, that the very fact that the weights are actually not discrete will allow me to compare with the gradient descent. So that's, a, that's something that I will want to do next. And, but I stay in the same setting of the teacher-student uh, model under the three main assumptions that I said, nothing of that changed. All that I will change is I will actually change the function that the teacher is applying to produce the labels. Okay? So instead of using sign, they will use an absolute value. And when you use the absolute value, you're actually falling into a class of problem that can be kind of broadly called phase retrieval you kind of lose the sign. I will keep things real valued, but if these were complex valued, you kind of lose the face of, uh, of the scalar product. So that's actually a problem that has a range of applications in signal processing and imaging, and it's interesting on its own. But here I look at it as a kind of special case of this teacher-student setting, and I'm looking at the problem still as a regression from the training data X and Y. My goal is still to get a good test error, to learn the function right. Whereas in phase retrieval, usually the goal is to retrieve this W star. But here I will be looking at learning the function. So since it is a special case of the setting and the formula that I have already shown you, I can readily show you analogous picture as the one I showed you before for the binary case that comes from, again, a paper that we wrote a few years back, where again, the test error is plotted as a function of alpha as before. Here, you actually see two places where something interesting is happening. So first of all, at half, so when you have at least half the dimension samples, 
you start to be able to learn the function better than just random guessing from the distribution from which the labels would be kind of the empirical distribution from the labels. So that's one phase transition of a, that is continuous in physics, we say second order. And then there is another one that is very much like the one in the binary case where actually the performance information theoretically drops to zero test error, or, I mean the performance, the error drops to zero. So the performance gets perfect. That happens at one. And again, the algorithm lags a bit behind and at 1.13 is also able to provide a zero test error. So that's the picture of what's happening in this real valued sign retrieval, if you want, real valued phase retrieval with respect to you know these, these results of high dimensional learning. Now, as I said, what's interesting here is to actually compare to the gradient descent because it's all nice to be talking about this approximate message passing algorithm, but that's not what kind of current machine learning uses. So, so let's, let's try to understand how the different algorithms actually compare. So in order to set up gradient descent for the phase retrieval or the sign retrieval problem, I need to write a loss. And here I write what appears to me as the most natural loss for a problem where I actually know that I lost the sign. Instead of taking the labels minus the scalar product, I just take square of the labels minus the square of the scalar product this way. The fact that I lost the sign will not matter. And it will be small if these two things are similar. And then I square all that and sum over all the samples. And that's my loss on which I will be writing writing uh, running gradient descent or flow if you want to go to continuous time and at a given initialization. So let's do that kind of empirically. And that's what we did uh, because, I mean, first of all, can we analyze in a closed form the gradient descent in a similar sense as we can analyze the approximate message passing? That's actually harder. The iterations of, you could say, oh, gradient descent is just an, an, another iterative algorithm. Why cannot you do the same kind of state evolution as for the approximate message passing? There is a, the approximate message passing is written in a very specific form that actually simplifies this uh, analysis, this state evolution that does not happen for the gradient descent. So it's much harder to analyze it. But so if you actually in computer science want to show something about convergence of the gradient descent to perfect generalization in this phase retrieval problem, you need to go to these papers where the sample complexity they need is actually much larger than the numbers that I was talking about. It's at least some large constant times the dimension. So that's far away from the 1.13 of the AMP that may largely be a byproduct of the proof techniques, or it may be a real thing. So that's why we just simulate it numerically to check, you know, is it, you know, what what part of this huge gap is real and what part is a byproduct of the proof technique that maybe doesn't allow you to push this constants to very low numbers. So even just by numerically running the gradient descent, you see that there is a big gap that at least that uh, you need at least the number of samples that is seven times the dimension and probably even more because it kind of keeps drifting to, to larger and larger alphas as you take larger and larger systems, the performance of the gradient descent. So the bottom line is when you try numerically, you see a huge gap, rather big gap you know, from seven to one. So what does that mean? Does it mean that we are kind of using an algorithm that is hugely suboptimal in all that we do in machine learning? So here I want to make like a point on that. That's okay, here I'm of course, put a lot of things that are happening in state of the art machine learning aside. So let me see if putting some of them back actually closes this gap. And the one that I will put back is the over parameterization. So that's one of these mysteries of deep learning that kind of shatters the bias variance trade off paradigm that, you know, we take the, this is a picture that I really like coming from this paper of, of Andrew Sachs and Madhu Anvani, where you have the kind of some of the very early manifestations of this double descent picture uh, happening where here you are fitting a sinusoid with two, five, 10 or 500 relus. And when you fit with two, of course, it's not enough. 
with 10, if you have 10 points, that kind of is very bad. The test error is very bad. You fit every point, but uh, it's, it's bad. Somewhere in between, you have a sweet spot where it looks kind of nice, but if you take 500, it's basically perfect. So having way more parameters than the number of samples is actually advantageous. And that's a generic picture. So what does the overparameterization do to now the setting that we are talking about? So still the phase retrieval, the data are generated as before. I want to run gradient descent, but now I write the loss that corresponds to a neural network that actually has a somewhat large hidden layer. So the size of the hidden layer for the next uh, theorem to hold needs to be at least as large as the dimension, but just by one is enough. It's something needs to be needs to become full rank. So so that's why, but it doesn't have to be like much more larger than the dimension. So all we do is that in the loss that I wrote before, I wrote here the sum, and I have actually now m uh, kind of student vectors of weights. And now I will be running gradient descent on this loss. Now, from a point of view of either physics or Bayesian inference, this makes no sense to do something like that. Because here I told you how the data were generated. This didn't change. You know that the teacher took some W star, one vector W star, and generated the labels using the absolute value of the scalar product. So why now in your learning model, you would assume that there are actually many such vectors? and optimize this. This is a kind of hugely mismatched prior from the Bayesian point of view and from the physics point of view, when you kind of know something is true in the world, you want to include it in your modeling. So this doesn't make sense, but anyway, that, that's what's happening. When we over-parameterize hugely neural networks, that's effectively what we are doing. So what does it do to the gradient descent? And that's where I really think it's really interesting here, this example. It's actually analysis of the gradient descent is something that we were able to do in this particular case for this particular loss in a paper with my former PhD student and Eric van der Neiden from UIU. And in this, in this kind of theorem that is a bit weaker, what we were able to, to, to prove, um, but kind of the, the result is that starting from alpha, the number of samples over dimension two, there actually is only one um minimizer of the of the of the over parameterized loss what we were able to prove is that the probability that there is only one is actually positive but that's weakness of the proof there actually is only one starting from alpha 2 and below there are more and putting that on my axis here and okay verified numerically that this indeed is the case and you're pretty confident about this too putting this onto this axis what it means is that by overparameterizing, you actually reduce the gap that you had between the approximate message passing and the kind of gradient and the gradient descent on the non-overparameterized non neural network. I didn't change anything about the algorithm. All I changed was the loss, and that brought the sample complexity to two. So the overparameterized neural network trained by gradient descent needs fewer samples to solve the phase retrieval to perfect test error. Now I want to kind of comment at this picture because I find it really interesting for several reasons. So for instance, imagine that you are here at alpha three and you're running your gradient descent. If you are running approximate message passing, all is perfect, everything works, you already learned the function. Now you don't know maybe about approximate message passing, you run your gradient descent. You don't overparameterize. you don't learn the function. Now you overparameterize more and more and now you start learning the function perfectly. So you conclude something like, I need scale, I need the neural network to be large in order to learn the function. True, that's, that's how you can interpret this result. But that's what I say here in the first point. But what it also means is that, well, you don't really need that scale because your function is very simple. You only need d parameters to learn it, not d square that the gradient descent actually would need to learn it. If you over-parameterized and ran the approximate message passing, nothing would change, actually. For the approximate message passing, the best uh, performance you can obtain is if you do not over-parameterize. And so this kind of together such as this question, whether the need of over-parameterization that we see in practice would not be just a byproduct of the fact that we are using the suboptimal gradient-based algorithms. 
And so I find that interesting, kind of, I don't have much more to say now in like state of the art networks, etc. cetera. But, uh, but if it comes from there, maybe we will not need eventually once we find the right algorithms and the right way of training these networks, we will not need them to be as huge as actually currently they are. So that's quite an interesting perspective, I think. So where am I? Um, so at Say, you know, next part of the talk that I want to tell you about, it's also related to the overparameterization. But when we talk of overparameterization in the relation of uncertainty quantification of neural networks, there is another quite interesting thing happening. So there is this, um, okay, let me, let me say a few words about the uncertainty quantification, and then I, then I tell you how that kind of the question it brings when the overparameterization comes into play. So first, surely you have seen these adversarial examples in many talks. I don't want to really talk about adversarial examples or adversarial training. I just want to ask this question, right? What does it mean that this is 99.3% gibbon? Right. So how do people get with that number? And is that actually any like meaningful confidence in, in the statistical sense. So what it means is easy, right? What, what one does in classification most of the time, one just minimizes the cross-entropy loss on K classes. It looks like this. And then when, say, in adversarial examples, people report this probability, what they take, they just take this score that enters in the cross-entropy loss. So these are numbers that are uh, non-negative and some up to one so you know they could be probabilities but are there some like meaningful uncertainties in the statistical sense right so that, that's the question that i would like to kind of look at and now in particular why this is interesting when you put the over over parameterization in the consideration the fact that the state of the art neural nets are so over parameterized that it's possible to train them to zero training loss how do you get a zero training cross entropy loss? The only way to get that function to zero is actually to make these scores to be such that all the probability is put in one class. So if you are training on cross entropy loss till the cross entropy loss being zero, you must be overconfident in the sense that everything is in one class, but in the real world, you know, you still have some test error, it's still not perfect. So you must be overconfident. You're putting too much confidence into that class. Now, of course, in practice, you don't usually train till the loss is strictly zero, you early stop. So this provides a bit of a regularization, but still overall, there is this kind of paradigm that overparameterization leads to overconfidence. And in general, then we need to fix it and calibrate actually the, the, the neural network. And like an, another motivation about this overconfidence, but I don't really have like much more to say on a GPT-4 is just a picture from the report on that paper. It's quite interesting actually that this is a calibration curve uh, before the fine tuning on the pre-trained model. And you know, in these type of plots, when, it, when the bars are close to the diagonal, that's good, it's calibrated. And when the bars are above the diagonal for smaller than half and below for bigger than half, it means that the model is overconfident. And this right-hand side where the model is overconfident, you obtain it after the fine tuning. So that's kind of interesting that before it seems fine and after you make it overconfident. But okay, this, as I said, I don't have like much more to say on particularly on this, this is another kind of topic. What I want to say about is go back to my teacher student setting and that kind of set of uh, solvable models. And now ask questions about the uncertainty, actually. What can we say about it? What, what actually happens with this overconfidence? How to fix it? What happens to it if you overparameterize? So that's something that, you know, the first paper we wrote about it is this one. And there, as, as I anticipate, we kind of have, again, the teacher-student setting, the only kind of thing that we added is that we took the sign and added explicit noise inside here. So this is a probit teacher 
you know, we want to study uncertainty. So having explicit noise also in the ground truth function that generates the labels seems like we will have one more parameter to kind of compare things to. And again, we take the high dimensional limit so that the main goal here is to quantify the uncertainty that comes from the fact that I only see a limited number of samples. So there is, of course, the uncertainty coming from, for instance, adversarial attacks, or from the fact that your test set may be shifted with respect to your train set, or from the fact that the ground truth has actually noise in it. But then there is this another one from the fact that you only see limited number of samples compared to the dimension. That's one of the sources of uncertainty that is typically difficult to kind of put hand on. And that's the one on which we want to focus. What, what is that one doing in the high dimensional limit? And I mean, as you are maybe seeing since the way I described this uh, information theoretically optimal learning was looking at the posterior and looking at the problem in a very much Bayesian way, it actually also means that in that approach, I also not only have the posterior means that give me the optimal um, estimator for the labels, but I have the whole posterior distribution there. So if I fix the train set and then I have a new sample here, actually the, the average of that sign gives me the probability, or it, we are this formula gives me also the probability that the new label actually was one. So I already have the uncertainty, kind of the base optimal prediction of the uncertainty in the framework that I told you about. So this gives the proper uncertainty measure for every typical test sample. And now having that, that takes into account the limited number of samples, the n is here what it is. Now I can compare to the logistic regression to these logistic scores and assess how kind of good or bad they are. And yeah, this is just to say that also the algorithm, the approximate message pathing algorithm actually not only has the um, optimal estimator in there, but it also has the probability of the labels, the posterior probability of the labels in there again via this expression. So everything I want to know about the uncertainty in the setting of the teacher student model under the assumptions that you know x is Gaussian, prior is factorized and high dimensional limit, I already have it there. So that allows me to do, to, to do the comparison to the logistic regression, which is minimizing the logistic loss with a regularization. And in particular, I will be looking at three values of this regularization lambda. One case, the non-regularized one, that's kind of a canonical thing to compare to. And then two different values of the regularization. One where I validate, cross-validate on the test error. And the other where I cross-validate at the test loss. So test error is just the number of mismatching and test loss, well, there's the sum of these logs over the test uh, set, right? So, so these are two different functions to minimize. And indeed the lambda for the cross-validation on the error and for the loss are slightly different. And I will, I will show you in a few slides. So now what's the kind of analog of the high dim of the, um, of the free entropy expression that we had before, now the same kind of derivation and, and, and theory gives me access to the following thing. It gives me access to a two-dimensional probability distribution that again is not a random quantity anymore. It's a deterministic quantity that, that concentrates on a deterministic formula. And what, what are the axes here? The axes here are on, uh, on one side. Here, for instance, I put the probability that the, label, that the new label was one for the teacher. So for the ground truth function that actually knows the teacher vector. So that is in a sense an oracle. The F star is the oracle uncertainty. In the left uh, right hand side figure, what I put on the y axis is the base optimal uncertainty is now if I evaluate the posterior, what is actually, and now that takes into account the fact that I only observed n samples, what is actually the posterior variance telling me about the probability that the label was one. 
Okay, so it's between zero and one is a probability. And on the x-axis, in both cases, I put the probability that I get from the logistic regression, this, this logistic score. It's again between zero and one. And I see in this case that it's kind of a very much spread with respect to the Oracle, reflecting the fact that, you know, the Oracle knows the ground truth function and does has a reduced uncertainty because it, in a sense, effectively sees infinitely many samples, right? It could perfectly see the W star. Whereas the Bayes optimal doesn't, it only sees limited number of samples. And we see that the distribution is much more narrow, that the, that the logistic regression kind of captures that quite well, in a sense it correlates better with the Bayes optimal uncertainty than it correlates with the Oracle. So that's kind of nice. Then what you see next is this blue line in the middle. That's actually the calibration line. That's just the average of the y-axis conditioned on the x-axis. Okay, so it's the average of this probability distribution. And you see this shape that it is larger than the diagonal for probability smaller than half and smaller than the diagonal for probability larger than half. That's the overconfidence, right? And so what we are seeing here is that the non-regularized logistic regression is already overconfident. You know, here I pick some value of alpha and tau, the noise and the number of samples over dimension, but kind of for broad range of these parameters, unless alpha is somehow ridiculously small, maybe there are some exceptions, but for broad range of these parameters, already the non-regularized, but not even over-parameterized logistic regression is overconfident. So I don't even need the over-parameterization for it to be overconfident. Now I promise that I will compare to the regularized one. So what now happens actually, so the y-axis is still the base optimal. The x-axis now are also logistic regressions, but this time this one, I choose a lambda that is the regularization that uh, cross-validates on the error and this one on the loss. And you see that they both basically get this line to be completely diagonal and the spread is very small. So what happened here is that the simpler regularization that you would do in logistic regression mitigates this overconfidence basically perfectly. So, okay, that's good to know. We just need to regularize. We don't need any fancy calibration based on, I don't know, Bayesian method or other things, at least in this case the regularization seems to be doing the job quite nicely. Now, okay, so far, this was a model where I didn't put any over-parameterization in. So will the over-parameterization change the picture? So that's what we asked in a second paper on this that we wrote with uh, my collaborators. Uh, Luca Clarte is the main author, the, is a PhD student in my group. And that was very recently in the last ISTATS conference. So, First of all, how do we put the overparameterization in? The simplest model that we can still solve in the same sense, writing closed full formulas, etc., is actually the random feature uh, model, where all we do is, again, the data are IID Gaussian and the labels are generated as before as some kind of a function of the data times, uh, times some feature. Um, but now the inputs, are actually pushed through a first layer of features that are fixed and not learned. And then there is some nonlinearity at the end of that first layer that creates some X tilde. And then the second layer is learned. So this is the, the learning with random features of, of Rahim Erecht. And it's kind of a nice, relatively generic model that actually when the width is large converges to a generic kernel method. And, and uh, also, since it is converging to any kernel method, it also captures the limit of neural networks that are captures uh, that are captured in the neural tangent kernel. So it looks a bit specific, but it's actually quite a generic kind of model that captures all the kernels and all the neural tangent kernel, uh, and allows us to make this hidden layer very large and so overparameterized. That will be the parameter p. And that's a setting under which we can write analogous closed formulas for the free entropy that leaves, uh, gives us the test error, the, the train error. And in a paper a couple of years back, we kind of concentrated on the test and train error and manifested this double descent curve uh, where 
for instance, for the square loss, that would be the blue line. We have this interpolation peak when the number of parameters over number of samples crosses one. If you are using logistic regression, there is also interpolation peak at a bit lower value because it's only the linear separability of the data that matters here. And what's interesting is that if we regularize optimally, then these interpolation peaks disappear. So that's a picture that has been described in a range of papers um, that kind of these days is kind of well understood, at least in the framework of say kernel learning or random feature learning. But now I'm just showing this for reminder. Now I want to concentrate on the calibration, on the uncertainty in that same framework. So that's what we did here. And we found something quite interesting is actually that um, now it's over parameterized and we regularized optimally, again, minimizing the error or the loss, that would be the blue or the red curve. And that, of course, in the test error, that makes the interpolation peak disappear. In the calibration, we actually also have some kind of a ghost of that interpolation peak that is there if we don't regularize, but that remains there even if we optimally regularize. So that would be the blue line or the red line. It actually there still is a bump that there is some sign of the interpolation make, making the calibration worse than it would make it if you are away of the interpolation. So that's kind of interesting that the optimal regularization removes the interpolation peak from the test error, but it somehow remains there in the calibration. So I also see that I'm kind of coming towards the end of the talk. I don't actually have I one. Should I be stopping already or have I five more minutes? Okay, Karen, looks like I can continue. So I just want to kind of make um, a few slight conclusion about, about how what I told you kind of fits into what hopefully one day will be a theory of deep learning. So the way I like to put it is that in order to, that kind of traditionally, we were maybe studying the optimization and algorithms separately from the structure of the data and from the architecture of the networks. But one I know needs to consider them together, right? We cannot put aside the algorithm, otherwise we are with some untractable approximation problems. If we put aside the structure of the data, do not model it, do not assume anything about it, then whatever theorem we write, well, it must be true for the worst case data. But we know that for the worst case data, these problems are NP hard. So we basically have no chance for them to be algorithmically tractable. So there needs to be something happening with the data that actually makes it algorithmically tractable. So we better keep that in mind. And for the architecture, well, we better keep it multi-layer as, as it is in the state of the art. And of course, so far in what I told you, there were no even any hidden units in most of it. Right, I talked about the overparameterization in two cases. So in that case, there were. The data didn't have any structure, right? My inputs were always Gaussian IID. The features were random. The labels were created by some teacher. I mostly talked about message passing, also a bit about gradient descent, right? In green, I'm now putting what we would need, the gradient descent, the data that are realistically structured and the multiple wide layers. So we have kind of been working in those three directions to make the, the line of work more realistic. And I'm kind of happy about the progress in two of them and not so much in the third one. So let me just show you a list of some recent works for the side of the algorithm where we actually know pretty well now how in the framework of these models to analyze actually explicitly the dynamics of the gradient descent based algorithms using something that is called the dynamic mean field theory. And I will not mention the details, just give you some references. But overall, I'm kind of positive that we can capture not only message passing algorithms, but also the gradients. Coming back to this side of the structured data, again, in those works 30 years ago, they kind of stick to the IID Gaussian data. And I promise that I will say a few words about how to go beyond that. And again, we have a line of work recently where we are actually showing that assuming the data are Gaussian, but not IID actually from a high dimensional Gaussian that has a covariance that matches the empirical covariance of the true data. We managed to generalize the formulas and show 
that they actually describe really well what's happening in real data. So in this, these pictures, those are some learning curves or some accuracies as a function of a number of samples um, of some real data sets, MNIST, Fashion MNIST, Cypher, or you know, Gaussian mixture is not a real data set. And then there are curves that are actually assuming the Gaussian theory. And you see that they are kind of perfect. And the, the key word behind these these kind of works to the Gaussian equivalent is a kind of kind of a generalization of a central limit theorem. So that's another line of work that we, we, we looked at. It kind of makes me very optimistic. Again, I'm not going into detail, but makes me very optimistic that we, we are we are quite okay in terms of taking the realistic structure of the data into account. The third part where we actually need to take multiple wide layers, that's where the roadblock currently stays. So what we can do is add in those solvable models, few hidden units, order one. And in that case, we call that the committee machine. And in that case, and here is the paper that does it, we in a sense have all that I told you about for the case without hidden units, the optimal approximate message passing, the free entropy that gives you both the performance of the approximate message passing and the information theoretically achievable error with all the constants. And interesting things are happening there. We have, again, these algorithmic gaps and can draw these kind of um, learning curves and diagrams. But now where it gets, you know, I like to end with, with what we don't know actually how to kind of do with this framework of this class of solvable teacher student models in the high dimensional limit is actually if the hidden uh, layer of the teacher was extensive, meaning that it's proportional to the dimension. So if D is the input dimension and K is the width of the hidden layer, then the ratio would be of order one while they both go to infinity. And then I have kind of three ways to think about the outputs and the number of samples. So either, as traditionally, I just take few outputs, order one. Then the number of samples could be maybe linear with dimensions. So this we actually understand. I will show you in a moment that it's not enough. It should be. It could be quadratic to match kind of the number of parameters that the teacher function has to actually be able to learn it that we already don't understand. Or we could also take more of the outputs and then keep this linear in dimension that kind of information theoretically also is a scaling that makes sense. Now, what do we know? We know about the first limit when the number of samples is just proportional to the dimension. There we have the explicit formula for the optimal error in a recent paper that could accept it in ICML, great. But we also show that that same error is achievable just by regularized regression. So that's a case where we don't really need the depth. So that's kind of a more of a negative result than of a positive result. And in that same paper, we also show that if we had quadratically many samples, then we could learn that teacher function with extensive uh, hidden layer width perfectly to very close to zero generalization while any kind of ridge or kernel combination of thereof method is not able to do it. But at the same time, it's a case in which we don't know how to generalize this type of analysis of writing a closed formula for the performance. So that's kind of our, you know, uh, I don't know, Leviathan in the room, the, the case that, that we would like to be able to solve within this framework, but so far are not. And we also wrote some papers, actually already a couple, on why that is difficult. And it's actually related to what one could call the extensive rank matrix factorization or sparse coding or dictionary learning or certain limits of those problems that we so far know how to solve only on the very, very special cases, but not under the generality that we would need to then use it in the analysis of this multi-layer feedforward net. So I'll stop with this and kind of leave you with this diagram that for me is the roadmap, how to go on. And I'm happy about these two directions, at least kind of the progress that is there in the literature. And in green, I put here the roadblock that is kind of a 
for me a big open problem that is very concrete, very specific, very mathematical about a given scaling and learning a given function and we don't know how to analyze that. And I think I have one more slide with the picture of the group and all the people that were behind those works recently, at least as the current one. Okay, so thank you, Lenka, for the very nice talk. We have a little bit of time for questions, let's say. We're, Lenka used her time well, but still some questions. Who has a question? You can either write in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and throw it at Lenka. Or an email later on if your questions come up later on. Uh, maybe I can ask a question uh, if that's okay. Uh, so. Uh, so, uh, so in uh, in various models uh, that you talked about, uh, you were able to compute the uh, asymptotic error uh, under certain kinds of scaling, right? Uh, yeah. So my question is, uh, what is the implication of this, uh, or what is the significance of knowing the value of the actual value of the asymptotic error? Uh, apart from like you know like uh, like you know mathematical interest, uh, so in terms of machine learning, what is the what, what is the uh, uh, implication that we can get out of knowing this? Well, uh, if you, I mean, okay, first of all, just it's asymptotic in in that high dimension limit, right? Which often right. in statistics when we say asymptotic we mean d fixed and n to infinity so that's not yeah, that no, 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 no. High but then right 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 but then what is the significance so so for me it's kind of if we are able to compute that then we are on the same systems kind of able to to answer broader questions right for instance such as the one about the overparameterization right like if you are able to compare to what is optimally possible then we get insight about how far from that optimality we are. And in the framework of these models, which kind of tweaks on what how the training goes and which algorithms we are actually running and whether it is over parameterized or not, which of those actually approach us to this optimality, right? And okay, so that's that's kind of, to me, that's interesting by its own. But then at some point later on, this could actually be relevant when we are when we are uh, choosing the hyperparameter, the hyperparameters and the way of training in practice, which of course in the current practice, the settings under which we actually have this control is like so far from the practice that that's not the case, right? But mm -hmm. but I mean the analogy that I like to put is the, it's kind of you know looking in the history um, of the of the machine uh, of the vapor machine, you know when we when trains started running and, and it was already a, a full industry when we had all the re revolution kind of on uh, mm -hmm. but we still did not understand the thermodynamics and how that actually microscopically comes about the whole Carnot cycle and all that and if we actually understand the driving principles of what makes certain algorithm work and certain algorithm optimal and why we need this and that tweaks in the architectures I'm just hoping this will you know this will uh, this will lead to some over, overarching principles that one day will lead to even better systems, as it kind of often is in fundamental sciences. Mm -hmm. so, so that's so, kind of that's the take. So, uh, uh, am I correct to uh, interpret it as uh, something like uh, uh, the the techniques which allow us to compute the exact value? are equally important or even more important than the exact value itself. Yes, uh, yes, that's also, that's a way of putting it that I would, that I would sign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of developing the, right, removing those roadblocks, like why is it actually difficult to understand a given, you know, how many samples we need in sci to get a given performance? Where does this mathematically come from? 
So mm -hmm. kind of removing one after the other, to me kind of that's, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting state of, uh, state of uh, matters for a theoretical mathematical research in machine learning. But I would even think generically in computer science, right? We are kind of used that computer science is simple enough that it's mathematically understandable. And now we are, in a sense, entering into an era where it's more like the biology or the universe, like things are happening and the engineers kind of made it work, but we don't, we kind of don't have mathematical control on it anymore. But that doesn't mean that we should give up, I think. Yeah, yeah that's kind of just Good. do what Thank we you. can. Thanks. I have maybe one question. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, um, so... What was interesting is that the the approximate message passing was working better than than the gradient descent. So, what do you think? I mean, gradient descent basically means that at some point you wrote it as an optimization, and maybe then there you just got all your local minima in the world. So now you have to just drop enough initializations in it to go to the correct local minima, which is sort of the overparameterization, which says it gives you more possibilities to start. And what do you think is the quality of the approximate message passing that sort of avoids this uh, additional complication that you got into as soon as you started to write it mm. as a gradient descent thing, as an optimization, basically? Yeah, so it's true that the overparameterization kind of gives do in a sense more initializations, more kind of points from which you start. That's the way you can think about it. But it also hides the ground truth, right? It kind of also, I, I mean, it doesn't do it, right? But kind of naively, it also has the power to introduce a lot of even lower minima that will be actually better. And the kind of true function will get lost in them. And the fact that this is not happening, that that's kind of the key, the, the key, interest i think of, of this question and why the approximate message passing is not doing that so that's a, a, of course a very interesting question there is a line of work that within a certain class of first moment algorithms where actually gradient descent belongs shows that indeed the approximate message passing in the framework of these models or of these assumptions that we are doing is the best that one can actually get so, so that's a, a line of work from, again, Andreas Montanari's group. So there is some like theoretical evidence that indeed, that if you optimize within a certain class of algorithms, this is the best one of them. And it's actually not so different from the gradient descent. There is also this work where you can show that uh, you can interpret the iterations of the approximate message passing as a gradient descent at the very for very particular loss. And that loss will depend on, you know, on all these parameters that you actually assume you know in that approximate message passing and will also depend on the running time. Okay, so it's maybe also an adaptive loss, but okay, there is a loss that you, that it, there is a way to write the approximate message passing as a gradient descent. So in a sense, it's not fundamentally different So, so it's more about how actually these, these particular uh, prox proximal operators, these particular functions that appear in the approximate message passing, how particularly they are chosen to actually match the optimal performance. To, to me, this is something interesting in the sense that only say maybe a few years back, I would have never guessed actually that the, maybe the gradient descent is worse. I would say maybe because it goes down too fast, but definitely if you say write the Langevin algorithm and the right noise to kind of want that wants to sample the posterior distribution, that should work as well as the approximate message passing. And this is actually not happening, even if I add in a sense, the right Bayesian value of noise into 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 the gradient descent, it still lags behind. We also, you know, in some of the works that I was just giving the reference, we show that. So, so it's really something more fundamental about the way it explores the the landscape and also the properties of the 
landscape. And those somehow seem to be, the, the hardness seem to be mitigated by the overparameterization. And to me, it's still kind of um, in the open to put really a hand of what's really happening there, right? So far, I would say we just have like few examples where few special cases where we can show it actually helps. But overall, to me, it's quite an interesting question. You know, another question that this raises is, you have a class of algorithms that get helped by overparameterization and a class like the gradient descent and a class of algorithms that do not like the approximate message passing. What is specific about these two classes? What actually defines them? I think that's like an interesting kind of computer science question, right? That we have different types of algorithms. Some help over, some are helped by overparameterization, some are not. So I, I don't have like, a, you know, much of answers. To me, it's more, I agree that that's an interesting question. But yeah, it's just, you know, kind of interesting to me also. Yeah. So is there more questions? Yes, I think yeah, there's- I have, I have a, a more conceptual question, uh, which ties into this optimization perspective that Karen raised. And uh, the question is, if we are we always assuming that the teacher and the student are architecturally different but and if if no then it's clear then that there is no optimal like the optimal is not so clearly defined but on the, if the student and the teacher are architecturally the same um, as i think was in the very beginning then why are why is the minimum mean squared error not reachable? Because the teacher kind of, the teacher parameterization represents the global optimum of the, of the optimization or um, what do I understand? Uh, or is there any misunderstanding there? So, yeah, side? so in the, as you say, in the kind of simplest case that I was starting with, they were the same, right? The teacher architecture, if I go back to the loss of the phase retrieval, Okay, somehow doesn't want to go back. Never mind. The indeed the teacher and the student were using the same architecture. This is the loss, mm -hmm. right? It kind of assumes that y is just the scalar product. So indeed, if I if I started the gradient descent as the w star, right, this would be zero. So I would not move. But I have to get there. Okay. And uh, and that's 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 not happening, right? There is a unique globe. Okay, yes, there is a up to a sign. Maybe there are two of them, like plus and minus. There are maybe two global optimizers, but overall, this is a non-convex landscape, and the gradient descent just gets stuck somewhere, either in some local minima or some in you know in some settles, like you know, it keeps like wandering around at some at some level. But why is then the information theoretic um, optimum not zero in this scenario? The information theoretic optimal, okay, let me go back to this, is zero, the test error is zero, whenever we have number of samples that is bigger than the dimension. Okay, but the gradient descent, even if this constant is still say three, doesn't doesn't go there okay. at finite time. Okay, I think I I'm I'm not sure if I I can catch up with that uh, just just now. Hmm. I, I might have to. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe the way to put it is maybe to go back to the Langevin. It's 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 kind of about the time it would need, right? Because if we put a bit of noise in the gradient descent, um then we very generically know that we will go to the global minimum at time, you know, for a finite system at finite time, we will go there. Now, the question is, how does the time scale with the size of the system? Here, I take the limit where D and N are going to infinity. Mm -hmm. And in general, the time scales exponentially with the size of the system. And here, I'm only looking in that limit where D and N are large, at times that are 
constant. So in a sense, the running time of the algorithm is just linear in the system. So maybe that's where, maybe that's where kind of the, yeah, the confusion yeah. comes from. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so in linear time, I don't get there. And I would say that's the scale that matters in those systems where he, ha where we have, you know, 10 to the 12 parameters or something like yeah. that. We just, we are just, we, we just can afford algorithms that are linear or maybe some logs we would, we would like tolerate, but nothing more. Yeah. Okay. I see. I, I did. Whereas, that. yeah. Whereas yeah. the approximate message passing gets there in constant time. And Right, and information theoretically, it would be possible starting from one, but there is this gap where, you know, for, for reaching the information theoretic performance, we would need exponential time. So this is, okay, for the phase retrieval without noise, it's actually not true. There is a kind of polynomial algorithm, maybe a d to the power seven that actually works starting from one. But it's a very, you know, it's nothing that you can even like implement for a decent system. So it's, it's when I'm thinking about algorithms, it's true that I should maybe have said it, and kind of implicitly, I should have said it explicitly, thinking about algorithms that not only are polynomial, but actually run in a linear time in the size of the system, because that's in a sense the only ones that we can afford at least in my kind of worldview. Now this, okay, well, one could of course argue that in some settings that's not reasonable. Yeah, thank you. We've used yeah, mute. Yeah. a lot of time. I would say, I would say let's maybe the next questions go by email or, uh, where will you be in the next couple of weeks apart from EPFL so that people can meet you to oh, let's see. You. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not like moving so much. I will be at some point in Slovakia for a conference, but I don't think anybody of <laughs> this audience will be on that at that conference, kind of a statistical physics conference. At a summer school in in France, another one again in France, and yet another one in France in summer. So yeah, if you go to France, then all, all Switzerland, then you may you may get close by. I can say uh, summer is a good time to visit Switzerland. You can do a lot of nice cycling and mountaineering and visit okay. later. So okay. thanks again. Yes. But, yeah, otherwise, if there are still some questions now, I mean, I can take uh, some more time. But de definitely, we should kind of like end up officially so that people don't feel like they should stay. But if there are some more questions, I'm happy to chat for I don't know, a few more minutes.